considerable respect, I must start saying, for, um, for organizations uh, like UNHUB and UNHUB in particular. Uh, I think that they are a vital organization to ensure the safeguarding of our democracy and it, it, it encourages action in order to ensure that, that, that there is harmony and democracy. And I really think that the, that the notion that, uh, that a constitution enacts itself and the very fact that we have a Bill of Rights and we have a constitution actually means nothing. And the real problem is that there is a huge divide between what both our constitutions say, both in South Africa and in India, and the reality of life. There's a huge disconnect between them. Both our constitutions recognize actually that, that they did not bring about the constitutions by themselves, bring about the kind of society they propagated. So in a way the constitution says that everyone is equal, and yet in South Africa 90% of white people think that uh, they are actually a bit better than, uh, than uh, African and Indian mm -hmm. origin and colored people. The constitution of this country also says that everyone is equal to the Dalit, but I suspect that if you go directly into the hearts and minds of, of, of non-Dalits in, in Indian society, there'll be only a classic 10%, if that, who genuinely believe that, uh, that Dalit people are truly equal with everybody else. Both our constitutions say that men and, men and women are equal, and as I always say, 90% um, of men believe that women are their inferior. And the saddest part, I think, is that 90% of women also, being so oppressed and exploited, actually believe that, uh, that men are superior, ultimately. And so with, uh, I mean, your constitution doesn't say this, but our constitution says that there shall be no discrimination against gay and lesbian people. There are all sorts of court decisions and so on which say that gay and lesbian people can get married in our country, which all sounds absolutely wonderful. It says that, uh, that, gay, that, 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 that homosexual, consensual homosexual conduct it can't be a crime. We made that very clear. Uh, but nevertheless, 99% of the people in our society who are not gay or lesbian believe that gay and lesbian people live in sin and look down upon them. Um, and, and so on and so on. I can go on. But the point really we need to understand is that the Constitution by itself does not achieve the kind of society it contemplates, and that our constitutions themselves recognize that, that work has to be done to achieve the kind of order that we want to achieve. So what does the constitution mean? Does it mean that our constitution, both in India and in South Africa, are utterly pointless and they are nonsensical documents because of this disconnect that I've been speaking of? And I want to say no. And I want to say that there is only one way in which those provisions of the Constitution can have meaning, which is that law by itself is not enough to achieve change. And I think what we need is a huge democratically based social movement aimed at changing ideas, aimed at changing thoughts, aimed at ensuring that changes come about where we all begin to understand the humanity of each other. I'll come to freedom of, of religion in a minute because that's a specific part of what I want to say. But the first part of what I want to say is that it is, it is not only lawyers. Lawyers can make a very small contribution. And I always say that lawyers too should be part of people's movement because lawyers are human beings first. As I have said on many occasions, we are human beings first and foremost. We are participants in the struggle to achieve a better society or a struggle for democracy second. And we are lawyers only third. So I want to say that the Constitution imposes on all of us 
a duty to act to achieve its its desired objectives and its vision. And what it does, it is a kind of launching pad. And the rights contained in the Constitution are really there to enable us to create the space for those of us who are active, to create the space to ensure that we achieve the society contemplated by our Constitution. So, without organizations like Anhai, without the development of huge social movements, without people still willing to make sacrifices, because we can't say. We can't say in South Africa we have a democratic constitution, that's it, we can now relax. Nor can we who, are entire, who want to achieve a better society in India say the Brits are not here so that we can relax. What we have begun to learn is that we can, we can be our own oppressors, um, in South Africa, black governments can be as oppressive as white governments were. Black governments can be as discriminatory as white governments are. And we have learned in India that the fact that, uh, that the government is locally sourced and it is made up, not, uh, it, it, it is not part of British no, domination, has got very little to do with our freedom because Indian governments can be as oppressive, <coughs> if not more oppressive, than British government. So while we are happy about the fact that colonial domination is no longer with us, there is no space for too much happiness in that regard, because uh, black governments in South Africa, Indian governments in South Africa, in, in India, have the potential to remain oppressive. And we have always said, that government can never be left to their own devices to get things right. Governments can never be left, left to their own devices precisely because left to their own devices, they will be selfish and they will be oppressive. And we have always held the view that strong civil society, strong labor unions, strong organizations are absolutely fundamental to the work that we actually do. In South Africa, we had a problem, and I think in India you had the same problem. We had the problem that all the people who constituted the strong civil society before 1994 and stood up against apartheid <coughs> were snapped up by the new government. So the strong civil society people became part of government, actually, with the result that in a very interesting and strange way it was our democracy itself which led to the weakening of civil society. And our government did not contribute towards the strengthening of civil society at all because once black governments got into power they sort of began to realize that uh, the strengthening of civil society is not really in our interest. <coughs> so that the same people with us who said strong civil society that is be absolutely necessary for the future suddenly became very different, you know. And, and the idea of developing a strong civil society while pay being paid lip service to by the government is not truly supported by the government. And we are beginning in South Africa just to, just to say to you that you are not alone. In South Africa, there's a commission of inquiry on at the moment. There were 42 miners who were shot dead in a miners' strike some two years ago in South Africa. Black miners shot dead by black policemen. And I want to share with you this little thing about critical race theory. Which and I want to ask the question, you see, we, we thought that only white policemen killed black people like that. All these 42 miners shot in the back of, in the, in the back of their heads, by the way, interestingly. Um, and, and there's a big commission on about that, but it raises a very interesting question, which is that transformation of our society and transformation of Indian society also meant the transformation of the police force. 
But our police force, like yours, I'd make brave to say, has probably gone a little worse than it was 20 or 30 years ago. But there's also a very interesting raised question. Because uh, I think, and we can talk about this because it's all about fascism and how fascism works ultimately. I really think that if these miners in South Africa were white, there is no way in which even those black people would have trusted. And, 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 and in a sense, I think that the same sort of thing uh, would apply here. We are very, very much our own oppressors uh, in some way. Okay, so, 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 so I think we need to make, we need to develop here too the strong social movement and the strong civil society. And really, until and unless we can organize and mobilize on a day-to-day -day basis so that the, 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 our civil society becomes as strong as civil society was shortly before the liberation of India, we are going to find it very difficult to get to places. So I just want to say, uh, organizing and mobilizing around issues which concern people and uniting people and raising consciousness on a step-by-step -step basis still remains the only way in which we can become stronger, in which we can educate. And that's the context in which I would like to speak to you about, about, about the topic that we have. So religion, to start with, is an extremely powerful force, is an extremely divisive force, and has given rise to so much violence in this country, in this world, and continues to give rise to so much violence in this world, that that is actually one reason why people who are too religious actually ought to be ashamed of themselves ultimately. So religion is a very important force. It is a force which helps mobilize our people against apartheid quite considerably. In South Africa, it must be told that Christianity and the Christian structured organized religion certainly made a very important contribution to our liberation. They, um, uh, churches were quite often sanctuaries of the <coughs> Religious sermons, and we've heard many a religious sermon by African priests who, which were really anti-apartheid sermons, religious sermons, which got through to many people at the level of mobilizing and organizing. So don't underestimate religion as a force. I suspect, though I don't know the history enough, you can tell me about it later, that I suspect that in the 1940s too, religion was a very important force in the achievement of our liberation. But the problem with religion being such a, such, such a fascinatingly big and important force is that they can play both negative and positive roles. So the way in which the whites employed, and, and, and therefore religion is never ever neutral, you must not get away with the, with the idea that religion is a neutral factor. It is not. So whites use Christian national education to refine apartheid uh, and, 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 and define apartheid in a way, whereas black people in their area use Christianity as an anti-apartheid tool, as a tool to achieve something greater. And in a sense, the only reason why it was actually possible to do that in the African area was that you were using religion to organize and mobilize people around day-to-day -day issues which concerned them. And in a sense, 
Oppression was an issue which concerned them. Housing was an issue which concerned them. Labor rights were issues which concerned them. And I think that it is possible, and it has been possible and has been done, to use religion as a tool, actually both ways, to achieve either good or to achieve either bad. I don't think the answer, if, if we choose to go the anti-religion route in organizing against religious fascism, and we'll come back to that, my own view is that religion is such a strong force that we're going to be into a hiding until now. We are really going to be messed up completely. So that we've got to recognize the religion as an important force. We've got to not make sure that we don't get upset by the fact that other people use the force negatively. And our job is to determine precisely how we can get into the psyche of our society, into the religious psyche of our society, even if we ourselves are atheists, or even if we ourselves are non-believers, and even if our, even we ourselves believe that negative that that that, that religion is, is is not important to us personally, I think we negate the importance of religion as a powerful force at our parish. And we try to negate that as a force, we try to reduce it as a force, that force is going to get greater and greater and is going to be used negatively unless we find our way to use it positively. And South Africa is quite a fascinating example of that. Now, of course, religion is being used negatively in South Africa quite a lot as well. Against, uh, against the Constitution and so on. So the interesting thing is that organizing is all about the balance of forces, isn't it, ultimately? And I'll come to the constitutional aspects of religion at the moment, but I don't think that's what we are concerned about. We are not, we are not concerned with what the Constitution says about religion and what the law says about <coughs> religion and what court actions we may bring and so on and so on save to the extent that those court actions may help us organize and mobilize. So it's not a lawyer's thing, just getting it right. It's how, how are we going to shape our, our religious position to make ourselves stronger and use religion positively? Because that is its only real value. And then we then get to the linkage then. So the first point I make is that you know it at your peril until and unless you work your way towards ensuring that religion is used as a positive thing and unless you work into the psyche of the people, we are lost absolutely and completely. Let's go to, and, and I suspect from what I hear that what the opposition is doing, I just call them the opposition, which is fair enough, our opposition, I mean, is doing, is very cleverly using uh, religion as a negative force. Uh, we get angry, we get miserable, we get upset about these things and so on, but there is no point in that. That is all quite useless and, and counter-revolutionary and counter-intuitive. We really have to sit down very quietly, understanding our our conditions, and hopefully we'll have some kind of discussion about that today, about how we use religion as a positive force. Now, in our constitution, our constitution, and I want to deal very briefly with how each of our constitutions deals with, with the relationship between fundamental human rights and religion, and I want to tell you what my understanding is of, of the protection of religion to a degree, so that that might help us to take uh, to take our issues, oh, oh, take our issues. Yeah, they want me to look. So, in our constitution, our constitution makes a makes an absolute distinction between freedom of religion, conscience, and belief on the one hand, 
and the practice of religion on the other. And when we talk about freedom of religion, content and belief, our constitution makes it quite clear that religious observances, because we understood quite early that it is religious observances at state institutions and in particular <coughs> state schools that is the problem. And our constitution makes it perfectly clear that religious uh, observances as state institutions can be done under certain rules and on the basis of, uh, on an equitable or fair basis and there's an absolute condition in our constitution that attendance at religious observances at state institutions is voluntary. Your constitution doesn't have that protection at a level. But I want to say immediately that you need a particular kind of maturity to meet that state because it is not enough to have a constitutional provision which says that this is voluntary. Not enough at all because let's just go to the reality. Let's assume a school with 500 children, 450 Hindu, 25 Muslim, and 25 Christian. A child has got to have a great deal of gumption to stay away from that religious uh, thing because you want to go there, you want to participate in it, etc., etc., etc. So it's a, that attendance at them being voluntary is a lovely constitutional point. But the point I want to make is that constitutional points don't make things right in society because what we need to do is, 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 is have a somewhat different provision. As far as the practice of culture and the practice of religious rights is concerned, our constitution has recognized that you can think what you like about your religion, it does no harm to anybody. But it is in the practice of religion and the way in which you practice it that the problem lies. So our constitution makes it absolutely clear that the practice of religion cannot be inconsistent with our Bill of Rights. So we had a case about this, which you might find <coughs> quite interesting. We had about 300 schools who were part of what they called the Christian Education Society, and who ran all these schools on the Christian basis. And they came to our court, and now I can, I'm not a judge anymore in that court, I have to listen to the argument in a straight face. But they came to court with what I think is an absolutely idiotic argument, but if you, if you disagree with me, we can talk about that in argument. And we can talk about that during our discussion. But the argument principally was that the South African Education Act would prohibit corporal punishment at school is inconsistent with their right to religious practice because in terms of their religious belief, corporal cor correction, as they prefer to call it, is an injunction of the Bible under the proposition, spare the rod and spoil the child. <laughs> and I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that we agree completely. Uh, but I, I sat and listened to argument on this thing for a whole day with a straight face. I promise. <laughs> and so they wanted permission to give their children high, to, to permission for their teachers to be able to give their children a hiding at school. And there were what? 300 applicants in the case. Huge case. You can't question somebody about what their religion is because there's nothing objective or rational about religion. Uh, and people who try to justify their religious beliefs as an objective truth are really making a mistake. Religion is a subjective thing. You believe it. There is a distinction between belief and reason. And therefore, belief is not subject to any reason. And that's a very important <coughs> thing about religion that we need to understand. You cannot subject belief 
to any rational or reasoned analysis. And anyone who tried, and many people tried to do that, many people tried to persuade people to believe through rational means. But I think all of us understand that the contradiction there is quite complete. So we say, unless, as, unless people say this is what we believe, this is what we believe, and that's it. But we duck the question in a very odd way. We said, what we've got to do, they don't say that the corporal punishment law is a bad law for everybody. What they say is that it's a good law, but they want an exemption <coughs> as Christian school. And then the reasoning we adopted was saying, the question we had to answer was whether the granting of the exemption will undermine the overall law, which is constitutionally compliant. And we came to the conclusion that there was no way in which we could grant an exemption without undermining the overall law, and therefore we refused to grant it. Okay? So we were able to do it without, without calling their arguments nonsense, and we treated it with a great deal of respect and care. But the important point to be made is that our Constitution has made that choice which your Constitution somehow appears to have made but your Bill of Rights chapter is drafted in such a way is that that choice in your constitution is just a little bit difficult and a little bit complicated. Um, all right, so, 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 so we, have, we have actually made that choice. Uh, so we'll go for Bill of Rights and, and, and no religious practice, even if it's a Christian religious practice, can ever be inconsistent with our Bill of Rights. And it is because, of, uh, okay, then, then your, your religion uh, is subject to uh, interesting propositions. <laughs> it is subject to public order and it is subject to morality. Now, it's a very interesting thing. Who was morality? Now, as far as we are concerned, our Bill of Rights is subject, is determined by the spirit, purpose, and objects of the Constitution. We say that all the values in our Bill of Rights give rise to, give rise to interesting, give rise to a value system. And it is that value system which is applicable. And it is that, that value system which ensures respect for religion. But this one talks about a morality and seems to be talking about a kind of majority morality which would make the morality put forth by the majority Hindu religion as distinct from constitutional values, the morality of your country. And we need to think about these things quite carefully in relation to precisely what your constitution mean, means by saying, subject to public order, we can understand. And thank God there was no big trouble yesterday as a result of all the Muharram things. Otherwise, we would have trouble. But there is some understanding of the public order limitation. But the, but the point is that it doesn't say that our fundamental values and human rights absolutely come first. Uh, it does protect at a level uh, for jobs and so on and so on. And it does go to equal protection. But the problem is this whole reference to morality and what does that mean. And therefore, we'll be dealing with, 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 with human rights and religion. The question is, whose religion are we protecting? And my view has always been that majority religion, i.e. Christianity in, in, in South Africa, Hinduism in, um, in India, and other religions in various other places, require no protection at all. In fact, majority religions require no protection. Majority expression requires no protection. Majority ideas of dignity require no protection because majorities protect themselves. So these freedom of religion protection and freedom of expression protection are all about protecting minority vulnerable religions. They're all about protecting minority vulnerable freedom of expression groups. And I, I always use the equality provision to say that what both our constitutions have done is that they've moved us away from the law of the jungle in which 
the strong can tread, trump, tread roughshod over the weak. The rich can tread roughshod over the, over the poor. The vulnerable people can go to hell. Only the strong are important. That is the law of the jungle. And that is the most immoral law we can have. And I have been advancing the proposition always that what our constitution, both our constitutions require, is for us to move away from the job, law of the jungle. And this is the point we've got to start making to everybody. We've got to move away from the law of the jungle. We've got to have a new idea. We've got to, we've got to make sure that the poor are as protected as the rich, that the weak are as protected as the strong. And it's an argument that we have which fits in with the religious argument, in my view, it can carefully be fitted in with the religious argument so that what we can do is propagate a Hinduism which even they can never deny. If we propagate a Hinduism which says we are about, we Hindus are about this, that, and the other, and we move along those lines, and say that this is why we pray and these are the things we pray for. And it's just one of the ideas, but I think we can have a lot more ideas about, and we need to workshop these things quite carefully, recognizing how big and how important religion is as a force. I think that's still my biggest thing. So, so religion, the freedom of religion clause then, is about protecting minority religions because majority religions look after themselves. And Hindus, and, uh, and this is the one part of our constitution in South Africa which has worked phenomenally well, and I don't know what the reasons for that are. But what is true is that Muslims are better off in South Africa than they would be anywhere else in the world. Because even in Muslim countries, you either end up being part of the majority sector or the minority sector, uh, you know, you are a Sunni or something or something else, and Muslims suffer a great deal depending on the sect to which they belong. So that even in Muslim countries, they're in huge trouble. Muslims in South Africa will tell you that Muslims in South Africa are better off than anywhere else in the world. And the Muslim minority, the, the Hindu minorities too, have no complaint at all. They are very comfortable, and somehow we have managed to we have managed to, to get that right. Now, the the the, the problem. Well, let, let me say this: the, 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 Why do we have a constitution? The basic thing, absent a constitution, the majority will always be right. Not so. The majority will always be right, and the majority was always right, in, uh, uh, would always be right in our country if we didn't have a constitution. So what does the constitution do? A constitution, by putting up rights, and your constitution puts up a great deal of rights, what it is supposed to do is to say that the rights of majority are subject to control. To say that majority governments cannot do precisely what they want to do. That the actions of majority governments are susceptible to constitutional control. That majority governments must, look, must obey the Bill of Rights and so on. The problem about that is that the notion of constitutionalism gets to be less and less understood as the constitution gains root. So although it's quite an obvious proposition, if you say to a senior Supreme Court judge, government is not supreme, the constitution is supreme. They're quite happy with the notion, everyone, that the constitution is supreme. They say that quite easily. But once you add the second proposition, that means that parliament is not supreme, that means government is not supreme, whatever their majority, you'll find a bit of trouble. In South Africa, one of the things I try to do always, everywhere that I speak, I try and make sure to make the point that if in our understanding of constitutional law and constitution, we lose the distinction 
between a supreme constitution on the one hand and a supreme parliament or a supreme government on the other hand, we lose the ethics and the ethos of constitutionalism completely. And therefore the constitution is about protecting majority, it is about protecting other people, and, it is a, and, and majorities will want to have a value system where they would want to do that for their own sake, ultimately. You know, I don't want people with disability to be better off because I feel sorry for them and I want them to be better off. I really don't want poor people to be better off because I feel sorry for them and I feel that as an act of charity they should be better off. My own view is very strong that I want poor people and people with disability and weak people and so on to be empowered and all that because I don't want to live in a society in which we trample over people. So it is for my sake, for my sake and for my ultimate comfort that I would like to do these things. So I suppose in a way you can say that my participation in all these things is for selfish reasons only. I really want the world to be a better place for my sake. I don't care about what, what anybody else wants. So that is the, 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 the sort of notion that we've got to work out. And what happens is that if we, if we it, it, it is the absolute majoritarian instinct combined with a belief system by a majority which is an ideal recipe to give rise to fascism under the guise of a constitutional democracy. Our job is to try and work out how we prevent this from happening. Because, because religion is such a powerful factor, and because religion is a matter of belief, and because religion means that people don't have to think, and because it is such a huge rallying factor, it's a powerful force for facets to achieve their, their way. But to get to the second proposition, because we've talked about religion, talked about human rights, we've talked about fascism and how that comes about in that context. And now we go to the last thing, which is democracy. So the first question is, is democracy a democracy where people can just go and vote every five years and that's the end of the matter? So I would suggest not. The second question is, is democracy neutral? And I would suggest not. Because until we get the kind of egalitarian society we want, and until we, we empower people, and until we educate people, and until we ensure that more and more people have, have, are, are socially and economically better off, the rich and powerful will actually remain in control and will continue to manipulate by bribes, by food, by presents, by all sorts of things, which are all very powerful factors. And you see, I'm, I'm trying to put it neutrally because there's no point in us getting angry about these things. Because if we get angry about these things, we really can't organize a movement. We've got to recognize all these factors as real factors against which we have to plan and we have to work. So a democracy is not only about elections once every five years, then the majority government goes on and do, does what it continues to do. So about a strong civil society is about the empowerment of people and it's about value. It's about a value system which we must render consistently with the Hindu religion. 
Because we've got to say that the Hindu religion is about our constitutional values, actually. And if you, if, if you unite those two in a meaningful way, you, got, you go a long way. So democracy is about values, and the interesting issue is what are those values, and what is the, 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 the civil society. And then finally, I'll tell you one more thing about a democracy, because some of these legal things are sometimes useful, even if we are not lawyers. Not very often. Sometimes uh, they actually are. Uh, the, the, the usefulness really amounts to this, that people used to believe that civil and political rights were the most important of rights. And that uh, courts couldn't pronounce on social and economic rights, and they used to call them second generation rights. But now, there is a complete understanding, it's important for us to have this understanding politically too, that if people are poor and miserable and they have hardly any food and hardly any water and hardly any clothes, it's really an insult to them and a humiliation to them and almost a joke, actually, to talk about their freedom of expression, their freedom of religion, their freedom of movement, and their right to vote. Really, it's a, it's a nonsensical thing even to talk about at that level. And therefore, there is a direct interrelationship between people having food and water and a certain amount of health and their ability to contribute to the body politic in a more empowered way. So in a sense, the proper, not only are civil and political rights as important as social and economic rights, in a sense, we can say that the enjoyment of social rights and economic rights, housing, healthcare, social security, and so on, at a particular level, are in fact a prerequisite to your exercise of your civil and political rights properly. So in a sense, part of our problem is the poverty and the manipulability and the failure of the proper exercise of the right to vote and the proper exercise of the right to freedom of religion or freedom of expression or anything else because of sheer disempowerment and sheer inability. And that's why part of this long struggle we have ahead of us is actually to empower people and to get that right. And make no mistake, the, the enemy is strong. The enemy is powerful, there are no easy rules, and there are no easy ways. We really have a long thought process and a long struggle ahead of us to work through these very important issues and hope that we truly contribute to the empowerment of the weak and poor people in this country in a real way that we don't use them for our own purposes and that they will soon be able to empower themselves and, and we'll be able to help that process. And hopefully, if some sort of strategy is started now on a continuous basis, we might be able to come here in 10 years' time and evaluate it and say, hey, this is what we've done, these are our strengths, these are our weaknesses, we've done it. But really, I think it is a whole new complete struggle at the same level as the struggle for the emancipation of India. So I'll stop here and hopefully we'll have a meaningful discussion and work through some of these important issues.